Hello, welcome to this video on multivariable limits. We're going to look at having a multivariable function and how does it work for us to take a limit? We know about single variable limits. What about multivariable? It, remember now, in single variable limits, as x approaches a, it's either approaching from the left hand side or the right hand side. We could do one sided limits, but if we don't have any indication, then we're looking at approaching from both sides and seeing if they agree. Um, what's going to drive the lecture is going to be these two functions here, the function f and the function g. The graphs are below them. We're looking at what's going on as we approach the origin for the function f. Well, now we can approach from infinitely many ways we can approach the origin. And so x and y both approach 0. The question is, what is z doing for the f function? It looks like it's approaching, uh, it should be 1 on the z-axis. But then something very wild is happening with G. It depends on how you approach where you're going to be at. And so we're going to look at it in more detail. But um, let's go on to the next slide. Okay, so for the one function, we're going to approach the origin um, through many different paths. Okay, we have F and we have G. Let's look at F. So when you don't know much about a function, one thing to do is to get to get um, y values, take x and y values and get z values. And so this is what this is, something for a computer to do, of course. And so what these numbers in the grid represent are altitudes, heights off of the xy plane. And so we can approach the origin, which is the missing part in the middle there, from many different paths. It's not, it's not like you approach, you can approach along the axis, okay? This, this here would be approaching along the, um, y equals zero, that's the x-axis. This here is the x-axis. And then uh, approaching, it looks like it's going towards one. And then the y-axis looks like it's going towards one. We could even approach along the line y equals x, or y equals negative x. Which one is which? Oh yeah, that's y equals negative x, that last one. It seems like they're all approaching one. And so we should have an idea that it's equal to one, but we don't know for sure. We have to prove it for sure. How about the other function? This one's very different here. If you approach along the x-axis, where y is equal to 0, looks like it's going to 1. If you approach along the y-axis, where x is equal to 0, looks like it's approaching negative 1. So you're approaching 1 along one path and negative 1 along another path. As you approach along y equals x, you, you're going to head towards 0. y equals negative x, you're going to head towards 0. So this wild disagreement with this function about what's going on as you approach the origin from different paths. Okay, so we're saying that the first function is going towards one and the second function doesn't seem to be approaching any one single number. So here's what we say with that. We say that the first function has a limit of one while the second function has a limit that doesn't exist. We gotta be careful about what we write under lim now. It's not just x arrow a, now it's x y arrow some point that you're headed towards here is the origin. Okay, all right, great. Well, how can we prove that the f function was headed towards one? There's, there's a, we're gonna go through a bunch of different limits and, and talk about how we can prove that the limit is equal to a constant. One such technique is to actually jump into polar. If you see x squared plus y squared, that's equal to r squared. You can then recast, recast your limit then replacing the x squared plus y squares with r's. What about the, the x, y headed towards the origin? What does that mean? Well, in polar, we have x is r cosine theta and y is r sine theta. So when x, y is approaching the origin, then what's happening with, with um, r is it's approaching zero. As x, y approaches the origin, r approaches zero. r is the radial distance outward from the origin. So as you approach the origin, no matter what the path is, all the radii are shrinking down to zero. So we replace the x squared plus y squared with r squared, and now we have a single variable limit. This is a limit from calc one. You could do it as L'Hopital's rule since it's a single variable. There's no multivariable L'Hopital's rule. You have the single variable L'Hopital's rule though, zero over zero. So we take the derivative of the numerator, divide by the derivative of the denominator, be careful with that numerator derivative. You'll get cosine of r squared, but you got a chain rule 2r. And then denominator has 2r as its derivative. Those conveniently cancel, and you end up with um, plugging in 0 now. You definitely get a 1. So 
That's the proof to why the f function went to 1. All right. Let's look at some other functions where we could find what the limit is. We'll get back to g. G is coming. Don't worry. Um, so this function here, um, x, y is going towards 1 and pi over 6. You should plug in x equals 1 and y equals pi over 6. If there's no division by 0, then whatever your result is is your answer. So we get sine of pi over 6, which is a half, and then the denominator is going to be 2. This function is headed towards 1 fourth. Always try to plug in first and see if you're being blocked. I try to plug in 1 and negative 1 here. I'm going to be blocked because the denominator is going to be equal to 0. Can't have division by 0. Okay. And so we're going to factor the numerator. Denominator is nothing to factor there, but the numerator is the sum of cubes. There's a formula for that. It's the, the sum of the uh, guys who are being cubed, and then there's a quadratic that's going to be um, made from that as well. And with that, then, that allows us the, the uh, ability to be able to cancel. It's a luxury. And now we no longer have division by zero. We can just plug in the one for x and the negative one for y and end up with three. End up with three. That's our limit. So you try to plug in. It's good if you can. If you can't, you might be blocked. One algebra technique to get you out of it is factoring. Um, a, a polar technique is to plug in x squared plus y squared equals r squared and replace that. Um, this technique is factoring as well. The denominator is four different terms. Uh, we're interested in approaching the point 2, negative 4, but we don't want to approach it along the line y equals negative 4 or along the line, um, I don't think that should say x equals x squared. I think I should say y equals x squared. Sorry about that. And so we um, factor the denominator. When you see four terms, a trigger should go off that you should factor by grouping. So what do they have in common? We have x, y factored from the first group of two and 4x factored from the second group of two. When you take the x, y from the first group, you'll have x, y times x minus one, and then you'll have 4x times x minus one. So you could factor and then factoring out the x allows you to, yeah, so this would just say uh, x equals 1 and y equals negative 4. That's what you have to avoid. And x equals 0, I guess. Anyway, um, that yeah, this limit, what's underneath that limit is kind of strange. Sorry about that. Um, but yeah, do your canceling now. Y plus 4 is cancel. And uh, we were interested in approaching as y. Um, so now we no longer have division by 0. And we could plug in the fact that x is 2. So I'll, I'll fix what's underneath there. That looks a little strange. x equals x squared. That's wrong. Okay, so we get a half for that limit. Factor by grouping. So factor, a cubic, uh, sum of cubes, factor by grouping. Um, here's another technique. We have uh, x, y going to 4, 3. But if you try to plug in x equals 4 and y equals 3, it's not going to work out well for you. Have division by 0. Um, we want to avoid um, x being equal to y plus 1. That'll have us division by 0. Any other path will be fine, but we're going to find out what this limit is by multiplying by the conjugate. You see, if you have a root and with the root or without a root with it, um, plus or minus, you can multiply by the conjugate, which is changing the sign of what's in between, not under, but what's in between. And upon foiling that, all the radicals go away. It's really nice. You're introducing radicals into the, into the denominator, but when you foil it out from the numerator, you get what you need to be able to cancel with the issue of division by zero from the denominator, root x times root x is a x, root y plus one times a negative root y plus one is a y plus one, careful though, negative, so it does cancel. And now there's nothing to stop us from plugging in x equals four and y equals three. The answer is a fourth. So these are all algebraic techniques to help you find the limit. If I ever ask you a question about limits, I want you to know that, um, if the limit can be found, you do some kind of algebraic technique like we just talked about. One of the ones we just talked about, factoring, multiplying by the conjugate, bringing in polar. Um, if, it, if the limit does not exist, like we saw in that function g, then we need to discuss uh, how we can show that it doesn't exist. All right. Um, so this is just a, a technical definition here of how uh, notation-wise, 
what does it mean to say that the limit is equal to some capital L? As X and Y approach this point A, B in the X, Y plane from whatever path, it doesn't even have to be straight line paths. It could be um, a, a, a path along a curve. As long as you're approaching and, and they all agree, no matter what path you do, take, they all are headed towards the, the letter, the number L, then, then that's your limit. Okay. Any path. So then when you get disagreement from two paths, then we're going to say that the limit does not exist. Okay. If the limit does exist, then you can do some algebra to figure out what happens. If the limit doesn't exist, you're going to have to just basically pick two paths, find out, you know, two paths that would make the limit disagree along those two paths. Um, I'll restrict you to have to worry only about six different paths. Okay. It'll be uh, x equals zero, y equals zero, y equals x and y equals negative x, and y equals x squared and the flip, the inverse of that, x equals y squared. Okay. If you can get disagreement along these two paths, then that's good enough. Um, now, if you don't get disagreement along these two paths, that's not a proof that the limit is going to be what you're getting each time. It's just a, uh, it has a chance to be that. So let's go back to G, this function G that we have here. And we want the limit as we approach the origin. And what's going to happen there is um, if we use the path y equals 0, that's the x-axis path, then we need to eliminate those y terms. y is equal to 0. And essentially, we'll have x squared over x squared, which is a 1. So then the limit will be equal to 1 if we go along the x-axis. What about if we go along the y-axis, letting x be equal to 0? If we go back to the function, the function's here. If we let x equal to 0, then you have a negative y squared over y squared. So that's going to go to negative 1. This disagreement, 1 along the x-axis, but negative 1 along the y-axis. Or is it the other way around? Sorry. Yeah, this picture might be off then. This picture is backwards. Sorry about that. But the point that is that they disagree. And when they disagree, we say that the limit does not exist. We could even go other paths. As soon as you get one disagreement, that's enough. All right. Here's another example of that. Um, XY on top of X squared plus Y squared. If you approach along the path um, where you have uh, the X axis, say, Y equals zero, uh, it's going to go to zero. Here's the function, and you approach along the path y equals zero. You got zero in the numerator, but you got x squared in the denominator. That's that's zero. Okay. And so, uh, if you approach along the path x equals zero, same thing's going to happen. Zero in the numerator, but y squared in the denominator. So that's also zero. Just because you get agreement though doesn't mean that the answer is zero. So we're going to approach along our third path, which is y equals x. Let's go back. If y equals x then the numerator becomes x squared. The denominator becomes an x squared plus an x squared. And so what's happening there then is you're getting a, um, a one over two. It's gonna be one x squared over two x squared. The x squares will cancel. So the function is approaching a half. Along the axes, you, you, you're approaching zero for this particular function, but then along the uh, y equals x, you're approaching a half. So you get that disagreement. Uh, let's do one more. Um, if you approach along any of the axes here, you're going to get zero. But um, I'm going to skip right away to path five, the y equals x squared parabola path. So replace the y with x squared. Your numerator is going to be x cubed. Your denominator is going to be x to the square plus x to the eighth. When you factor out the x squared, You'll be able to cancel with the x to the fifth. I might have said x cubed up top. I'm sorry. That was x to the fifth. Um, and then you, you have, you're left with x cubed on top of 1 plus x to the sixth. And so what's going to happen there, we're headed towards the origin. x is going to go to 0 here. So you're headed towards, um, you head towards 0. So wait a minute. So yeah, 0 for the axes, 0 for... Um, y equals x squared, but if you go towards the x equals y squared, you get a half. Let's go back to the function. If x is equal to y squared, then um, 
the denominator y squared squared that'll be y to the fourth that can be added up and then the numerator is just an x so you replace that with y squared times the times a y squared so you end up with um y squared times y squared in the numerator y to the fourth plus y to the fourth in the denominator nice cancellation so you get a half so zero for for the parabolic path y equals x squared but then half for the parabolic path x equals y squared different paths lead to different limits the limit doesn't exist i'm so sorry this is a 15 minute video it makes no sense but i wanted to just have it all together everything about limits sorry about that but anyway that's the end now thank you for watching my name is nakaya wimmer trying to navigate you through this multivariable calculus and i am here to help please reach out to me if you need anything uh, if you have any questions um, comment down below and, and like and subscribe i will see you in the next video take care